Sue McGregor and guests recall the JFK assassination on the reunion. Now on BBC Radio 4, key witnesses, the bodyguard and the surgeon who fought to save the life of the president are among Sue McGregor's guests in a special 100th edition of the reunion, recorded in Dallas. On a warm summer's day in Dallas, the grim events of one winter's day back in 1963 do still seem very close. As it happens, the weather's very much the same. Sunshine after heavy rain in the earlier morning. On the road right in front of me, there's an X on the tarmac to mark the exact spot where a president of the United States was mortally wounded in the head by a sniper's bullet as President Kennedy's motorcade made its planned turn onto Elm Street, the Texas School Book Depository on the corner of Houston and Elm loomed up behind them. Up on the sixth floor, there was a man with a rifle and a very accurate aim. As they passed through Dealey Plaza, the President and his party were only five minutes from their destination. But what happened here almost 50 years ago was to shake the entire world. Here is a further report after we have just received word that shots have been fired at the Kennedy Motorcade. We just talked with the police department. Here was that conversation. Several persons arrived at Kaufman and no information is being given at this time. But you did have reports of uh, shots being fired. We had reports, yes, sir. Stay tuned to Cliff News. Everybody. President Kennedy's two-day trip to Texas was an important one for him politically. With a presidential election due the following year, he hoped to heal the growing split between the conservative and liberal factions of the Democratic Party there. Kennedy's companion on the trip was the Texas-born Lyndon Baines Johnson, who'd been carefully selected as vice president to boost his appeal in the South. With the next election less than a year away, the Kennedy team knew that the Texas vote could be crucial. On the morning of November the 22nd, Kennedy appeared at a breakfast reception for the Chamber of Commerce in Fort Worth before the trip to Dallas. But the real star of the show was Jackie. As you can tell from your action, that's Mrs. Kennedy coming in. For the ladies in the audience, she's wearing a pink outfit trimmed in black, a wool of some type. And JFK seemed in a jovial mood. Nobody wonders what Lyndon and I wear. Two years ago, I said that, uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. There's Mrs. Kennedy, and the crowd yells, and the President of the United States. And I can see his suntan all the way from here. Kennedy and his entourage then took the 13-minute flight from Fort Worth to the Love Field Airport in Dallas. The people were already lined up to see the president. They were so excited to see him. Nellie Connolly was the wife of the Texas governor, John Connolly. She recalled the day's events in an interview in 2003. He was delighted, and so was she. And John and I were like proud parents, where our children were behaving so well, and the grandparents were really enjoying them. Most of the smaller signs are hooray for JFK. It was a generally enthusiastic crowd, but there were some dissenting voices. But there are those opposition signs, one reading, Help Kennedy Stamp Out Democracy. At 11.55, the presidential motorcade began its scheduled nine-and-a-half-mile journey through downtown Dallas to a luncheon speech for business leaders that had been arranged at the Trade Mart. Cheering the motorcade with her school friends was the 13-year-old Janice Gush. We went up there in our little shorts, and our t-shirts with our big pink rollers and we looked at Mrs. Kennedy and I remember she looked at us with her perfect pink lipstick that matched her pink and navy suit so demure and just kind of smiled at us and I bet she thought oh these are Texas women you know thousands will be on hand for that motorcade now which will be downtown Dallas It'll turn on Houston Street to Elm under the triple underpass. And so we watched the motorcade go on. We were just so amazed to see the president coming to Dallas. Joining me here in Dallas today are five people, all of whom were astonishingly close to what happened that day almost 50 years ago. Hugh Ainsworth, who covered the presidential visit for the Dallas Morning News. Gail Newman on the motorcade route as a spectator with her husband and two young children. 
Homicide detective James R. Lavelle, famously the officer handcuffed to Lee Harvey Oswald when Oswald himself was shot. Dr. Kenneth E. Salyer, who worked with the team at Parkland Hospital to try to revive the president. And joining us from Washington, D.C., Clint Hill, Jackie Kennedy's bodyguard, who desperately tried to shield the president and the first lady from the bullets. Clint, I'd like to start with you, if I may. You were a very experienced bodyguard, and before uh, the first lady, Jacqueline Kennedy, you, you had helped uh, protect President Eisenhower. You knew her pretty well by the time she came to Dallas. Yes, I did. Uh, I started to work uh, with Mrs. Kennedy in November of 1960, immediately after the election. So during that period of time, we did get to know each other extremely well. I didn't want that assignment because I wanted to be with the president, but I had to take it, and I did. Uh, she really didn't want me there because she didn't want anybody looking over her shoulder 24 hours a day either. But we uh, kind of agreed that we would get along with each other, and we did. And I remained with her right through the uh, visit to Dallas on November 22, 1963. Gail Newman, you were among the crowd, but you chose a good place to watch the motorcade. What brought you and your husband there? Was it simply curiosity? We were excited about the president coming to town. We knew the motorcade route, and uh, being Dallasites, we were familiar what would be the best place that we could go to stand. We had only been uh, there on the curb for probably less than five minutes when you could hear the crowd cheering, just shouts of joy and we uh, were excited to, for the children to see a president you know it's not too often that a president comes to town Hugh Ainsworth as a very experienced journalist you were covering the presidential visit but that wasn't really your area of expertise at that time was it well it really wasn't and I wasn't assigned to do anything that day at all but I decided at the last moment almost to, to go over there and watch it because some of these people were six and eight and ten deep along Main Street. And I had been rather anticipatory because the day before I had talked to some people who were going to cause a little trouble with signs and Uncle Sam suits. and These were anti-Kennedy people. They were. And... Uh, I was concerned that there would be an embarrassment of some kind. At that time, you had a small cadre of far-right nuts, and they were vicious. I mean, really. Ken Salyer, you were then a, a sort of tyro doctor. You were quite young. Was it an ordinary day at Parkland's Hospital for you, the morning of the presidential visit, once they came to Dallas? It was an ordinary day in that I went in early and made my usual rounds, but I was also excited, and we were aware that the president was there and knew that if there were a problem, that he would be brought to Parkland Hospital. I had wished I could go down to the motorcade and see him. I He was my hero. I'd voted for him, and I was excited. We, many of us were excited that he was in town. James Lavelle, you were a police officer in Dallas. You were a homicide detective. What were your plans for that morning? Well, I didn't have any particular plans made, and I did not have an assignment that day. And uh, I had no problems with him as a president. I don't remember whether I voted for him or not. But uh, Really? No, I really don't. Uh, uh, but uh, like some people had got out that uh, he was hated in the state, I never found anyone that I talked to later on who said they hated him. Clint Hill, the decision to let the President, the First Lady, and Governor and Mrs. Connolly travel in an open-top car, this was obviously discussed thoroughly in advance of the visit to Dallas-Fort Worth. Well, President Kennedy desired to be in an open car whenever he was in a motorcade parade type situation where people came out to see him. And although this car had a plexiglass bubble top roof available, he did not like that on the car and insisted it not be used unless it were raining or the wind was blowing so hard it would affect Mrs. Kennedy's hair. We were in Fort Worth. The supervisor checked with the advance agent in Dallas about the weather conditions. He said it was beginning to clear. As soon as he said that, the word was spread, bubble top off. He wanted the people to feel that he was one of them, that there was nothing between them and him, no barrier. We understood that, and we accepted it. 
we had to adjust for it. Nelly Connolly recalled what happened next in Dealey Plaza. We had all these wonderful crowds, and I could restrain myself no longer, so I turned around in my jump seat, and I said, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. He smiled, what a wonderful grin, and I turned around, and it was just seconds before I heard this loud noise. It, it, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. The first shot missed the president. The second hit him in the shoulder and the throat before going on to strike Governor Connolly. The third shot came, and... I couldn't look back anymore because of the heavy weight of my husband in my lap. But all over the interior of the car and all over my clothes were tiny little bloody somethings that just dropped all over. It's like buckshot. We understand Governor and Mrs. Connolly are in the car with President and Mrs. Kennedy. We can't see who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. Several shots were fired as President Kennedy's motorcade passed through downtown Dallas. Robert McNeil filed the first national report for NBC. A uh, crowd screamed and lay down on the grass. It was not known if the shots were aimed at the president. It was so awful. You just can't imagine being in that car with all that blood all over everything and all this matter all over it. It was unbelievable. And... I heard the uh, Secret Service man in the front say, pull out of the motorcade and get to the nearest hospital. And so we just flew. More details just arrived. Mrs. Kennedy jumped up and grabbed Mr. Kennedy. She called, oh no, the motorcade sped on. United Press says that the wounds for President Kennedy perhaps could be fatal. Clint Hill, nobody was closer to the president or the first lady than you. Can you go through your feelings at the time, what you did, what you remember? I was on the running board of the car immediately behind the presidential vehicle. I was on the left-hand side. And all of a sudden, I heard an explosive noise over my right shoulder from the rear. It seemed to be from an elevated position. I then started to look toward that noise, but my vision only got as far as the back of the presidential vehicle, and I saw what happened in the car. I saw the president grab at his throat, and he violently moved to his left, and I knew something was wrong, so I jumped from my position, and I ran toward the presidential vehicle with the intent of getting up on top of the rear of it to form a shield, but when the third shot was fired that hit the president, in the right rear of the head and there was blood and brain matter and bone fragments that came out of the wound that material went all throughout the car covered mrs kennedy the back of the car and on myself as well and when that happened i was just about to get on the car and then the driver accelerated as i tried to get up i had slipped because of the acceleration I had to take a couple extra steps. I finally got up on the back of the car. And as I did so, Mrs. Kennedy came up in the trunk. She was trying to reach the material that came off the president's head. I got a hold of her and I put her in the back seat. And when I did that, the president fell to his left into her lap because his eyes appeared fixed and there was a severe wound in the upper right rear of his head. I assumed that it was a fatal, fatal wound. If you had managed to get there in time, which would have been virtually impossible from your position, given that the shots were so quick, one after the other, would you have been prepared to throw yourself on the presidential couple to shield them? That's correct. That was my job. Gail? I had never been around gunfire at all, and my reaction was I thought someone had thrown firecrackers. President Kennedy sort of threw his hands up, and I thought, well, he's got a good sense of humor. But we were standing at the very edge of the curb when that third shot rang out. And the, you, you could see the bits of flesh flying in the air. I, I was immediately, I guess my mother instincts took hold. I was terrified for my children. And we turned and put the children on the grass and uh, shielded them with our bodies. 
it's hard to explain uh, the emotions that you have. I was just scared out of my wits, really. Hugh. I, like uh, Mrs. Newman, thought the first shot was a motorcycle backfire because one had just gone by. And the second shot I heard, I could hear the whine of a rifle. Immediately, everybody was throwing their children down, regurgitating, screaming, crying, running. I didn't know what to do. But as a journalist, did you suddenly find a mission? I suddenly realized that I didn't know what was going on, but I I needed to start talking to people. Clint Hill, at this point, you were going hell for leather, heading for hospital help for the president. Uh, We were traveling about 80 miles an hour. I was up on the back of the presidential vehicle, uh, wedged in on top of the rear seat above uh, President and Mrs. Kennedy. The only thing she did say was, uh, I have his uh, brains in my hand, and, oh, God, they've shot his head off. I love you, Jack. That's all she said. And uh, we got to uh, Parkland Hospital uh, within about four minutes. Then Mrs. Kennedy, with the president, his his head in her lap, was holding on to her husband. And I asked her to please let go and let us help the president. And she continued to hold on to him. I finally recognized that the problem was she didn't want anybody to see the condition he was in. And so I took off my suit coat, and I placed it over his head and his upper back. And when I did that, she let go, and we lifted the president up and raced into the emergency room. As soon as we got the president into trauma room one, my supervisor instructed me to open a phone line to Washington, D.C. And about that time, the telephone operator cut in and told me that the attorney general wanted to talk to me. That happened to be President Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy. He asked me, uh, what's happening down there, Clint? And I said, uh, Mr. Attorney General, the president's been shot. And he just said, asked me then, well, how bad is it? And I didn't want to tell him that his brother was dead. So I simply said, it's as bad as it can get. And with that, he hung up the phone. So you were the person who broke the news to Bobby? Unfortunately, yes. Dr. Ken Solia. I knew as a surgeon on neurosurgery that I needed to be in the emergency room. I ran downstairs as fast as I could and entered trauma room number one where the president was on the gurney and we were trying to uh, put a tube down his throat to give him an airway and couldn't get it past the injury in his neck. He was still moving air through his trachea wound. Technically still breathing. Technically still breathing, called agonal breathing. So we worked on him for what seemed like hours, and we did everything that we knew. We put chest tubes in, started IVs, gave him blood, gave him steroids. There was a straight line on the EKG. There was no response, and we had to pronounce him. So my chief of neurosurgery, Kemp Clark, made the official pronouncement at 1 p.m. Dallas time. That the president was dead. That the president was dead. My hero had died in my hands. The, the Catholic priest came into the room and administered the last rites. Mrs. Kennedy came over and I simply nodded, said no words. She leaned over him, leaned on his chest, and put a ring on his finger. This was one of her rings? I think so. Gail Newman, we heard journalist Hugh earlier say that as a professional, his first job was to talk to people who might have witnessed something. Can you remember who the first people were who came up to you? Uh, Yes, we were on the ground just a few minutes, and the people were running past us up the grassy knoll. And uh, two television personalities came they asked us what we had seen and we told them that the president had been shot and they said will you come with us to channel 8 wfaa and we told them yes they at first said that the president was still alive and i couldn't figure out how a person could 
have half of his head blown off and still be alive. It just, you know, it puzzled me. But I was so shook up and worried about my boys that I really wasn't paying any attention to what was going on around me. And then they uh, put us on, on television. Mrs. Newman, would you come in, please, and let me get your account. Sit right over here. And a little boy. Did you get some coffee finally? I don't drink coffee. Well, would you like to have something? I know that no, you... No, um, my stomach's kind of churning. This is Nunley. No, Newman. Newman. I've been calling you. I'm sorry. I don't even remember my own name, really. It's terrible. Billy, that's our youngest son. He's getting old enough that he remembers things like that, and we wanted him to be able to say that he saw President Kennedy. And, and now uh, he will be able to say that he saw President Kennedy when he was shot. Uh, yes. It, he's already saying, Mother, why would someone want to shoot President Kennedy? Um, why would they want to kill him? Like the Newmans, Charles Brem was a key witness. He was on the opposite side of Elm Street. My five-year-old boy and myself were by ourselves on the grass, and I asked Joe to wave to him, and Joe waved, and I waved in the man. The man. That's all right, sir. As he, as he was waving back, he was, he was, the shot rang out, and he slumped down in the seat. Official confirmation of the president's death came at 1.33 p.m., from his press secretary, Malcolm Kilduff, at Parkland Hospital. John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time. The vice president was not hit. Walter Cronkite passed on the news to viewers of CBS. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital. Uh, presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th President of the United States. Ma'am? I can't sit up. <laughs> Reaction came in from cities across America. I just can't believe it. I just, I feel like uh, someone in my own family is dead. Is dead. I just can't believe it. Everyone must have thought, including you, Hugh, is this one person or is this half a dozen? Is this a terrible conspiracy from some foreign land? We, we really didn't know. We, we didn't know how many shots really there were. I heard three. We didn't know if there was someone else somewhere, you know, waiting. We, we just didn't know anything at that time. I saw a man pointing up to the depository window. And his name was Howard Brennan. And I ran to him, and later we, we determined that he was the one, the only eyewitness. And from his description of Oswald, they put the all-points bulletin out a few minutes afterward. James Leval, uh, as a police officer, did you think there's something I can do here? Well, I headed down to the book depository. There's an inspector of police standing on the front steps of the depository. He said, there's been some witnesses come up and tell me they saw several different things. And he said, I didn't know what to do with them, so I sent them over to the sheriff's office. Knowing how witnesses have a way of changing their story, I went over to the sheriff's office to check on the witnesses. And when I got there, the chief deputy sheriff was in their meeting room. And he said, I've got all of your witnesses. What do you want me to do with them? And I told him, I said, well, we need statements from each of them. You've said to yourself, we've got to get this absolutely straight. Right. But the sheriff's squawk, squawk box was on, as we call it. And at about that time, they, they put out the call that a police officer had been shot in Oak Cliff. So I told him I would take it. And Hugh Ainsworth, your story was going to get more and more enormous as the day went on. It did. We, we didn't have cell phones and all the, the things we have today. As a newsman, you had to stay close to a police radio because you knew if you stayed close, you could hear what was going on and where. And that's when I heard the officer had been shot. Can you remember what your first conclusions were? Well, one of the first thoughts when I heard that the officer had been shot, someone shot at the president and a police officer killed three or four miles away, there's a chance that there's some connection here. I jumped in a car with two uh, WFAA-TV reporters, and we sped to Oak Cliff. At Elm 
Houston is reported to be an unknown white male, approximately 30. Within an hour of the shooting, police radio gave the description of a suspect reported to have been seen in the window of the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Then came the reports of the shooting of Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett, who'd approached the suspect on the corner of 10th Street and Patton Avenue. Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested in a nearby cinema, the Texas Theater. I like some legal representation. I, uh, I don't know what this is all about. Did you shoot the president? No, they're taking me in because of the fact that I live in Missouri. I'm just a patsy. On the way back to Washington on board Air Force One, Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson was sworn in to the highest office in the land and recorded for posterity on his secretary's dictaphone. LBJ's first call was to the redoubtable Rose Kennedy, the mother of the dead president. Thank you. Yes, Mr. President. Yes, I wish to God there was something that I could do, and I wanted to tell you that we were greeting with you. Yes, well, thank you, thank you very much. Thank Bird. you very much. I know. I know you love Jack, and he loved you. The funeral of President Kennedy took place on November the 25th, 1963, in Washington, D.C., just three days after the events in Dallas. The drums that rattled at the head of the cortege from the White House to the Capitol were a muffled summons to people and to government. Even at this moment of tight-lipped sorrow, one feels America's strength. On the morning of Sunday, November the 24th, Oswald was being moved to the county jail, handcuffed to James Lavelle. In the basement of police headquarters, a crowd had gathered to watch. There is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. The shot rang out. The shot has rung out. And Lee Oswald falls. Lee Oswald has fallen. A shot has rung out here. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Lee Oswald, Lee Oswald has just been shot. Hugh, you were close by when Oswald was arrested. Can you describe that? Well, once again, I, I went to a police radio, and I heard them say there's a suspect in the Texas theater. So I ran to the theater, and I saw people on the stage and a couple of people walking up. By the time they got to the suspect, there were three or four people very close. And he said, well, it's all over now. Oswald said that. But it wasn't all over now because he pulled his right hand up and had a pistol. And by that time, there were five or six people stumbling over the seats, and, and they got him. And James Leval, you became the subject with Lee Harvey Oswald of a remarkable photograph of the moment when Jack Ruby pointed the gun and shot at Lee Harvey Oswald, who was handcuffed to you. Uh, just before you tell us about that moment, did you have a chance to get to know him in any way at all, to talk to him, Lee Harvey Oswald? Only very briefly, about 15 minutes or so. But I had no clue at that time that he was going to be a suspect in the presidential assassination. I was talking to him strictly about the police officer, which he denied. He said, I didn't shoot anybody. And I found that very strange later when I got to thinking about it. Was he calm when you spoke to him? He's very calm and collected and uh, seemed to have no more emotion than you do right at the moment when I'm talking with you. And when did you discover that he was a, a strong suspect for killing the president? Captain Fritz had come back from the school book depository. They had found the rifle and went uh, and gathered up the shells and so forth down there. And Oswald was the only one missing when somebody told him that uh, the man Lavelle's talking to has got a name similar to that. Then he asked uh, Oswald, so where do you work? And when he said a school book depository, Captain said, well, you're the man I want. So he took my prisoner. I didn't have a prisoner anymore. But just, what, a couple of days later, there you were handcuffed to him while he was being taken from the police headquarters to the court. Right. Beginning Friday night, we began to get anonymous calls that they were going to take him away from us and uh, string him up and do all sorts of things to him. 
captain and I talked about it, and I said, well, I'll handcuff myself to him. That way, if they take him, they got to take me too. And then in the process of uh, handcuffing him, I made the remark to him. I said, Lee, if anybody shoots at you, I hope they're as good a shot as you are, meaning, of course, they'd hit him and not me. And he kind of smiled, and he said, well, nobody's going to be shooting at me. And you can tell you that, uh, that uh, everybody was clicking their cameras and all that. I was there. I could not see it. I was about four or five people behind because by that time, Sunday morning, there were people from all over the world, newsmen. And it was just a madhouse in that basement. You knew of Jack Ruby, did you? Were you familiar with the name? I had met Jack Ruby 13 years earlier when he was running a dance hall down in South Dallas. Did you spot him in the crowd when you were handcuffed to Oswald? As I went through the door into the basement area, I spotted him. He was standing approximately in the middle of the driveway, and he had that pistol in his right hand and holding it tight against his leg. So I immediately jerked on Oswald and tried to pull him behind me, but since I was right up against him, uh, I didn't have any leverage to pull him. You tried to shield Oswald? Yeah, I tried to pull him behind me, and all I did was turn his body so that instead of the bullet hitting him dead center, it went about three or four inches to the left of the navel. But it went all the way through him and come out on the other side. Was he still alive at this point? Oh, Lord, no. He never gained. He dropped over and went unconscious right after he was shot. Hugh, you knew Jack Ruby, too, rather like uh, James did. I probably knew him a little little better the, uh, right beforehand because I was single and I went to his clubs occasionally. <laughs> Would you describe them as nightclubs or strip clubs? Or? Well, this was a strip club. You always see him at the newspapers trying to get his stories about his strippers. He was a show-off, and he was a mean guy. What do you think his motives were? I think he wanted to be somebody, pretty much the same as Oswald. Do you agree with that, Jim? Absolutely. I transferred him the next day. I told him, I said, you didn't do us any favor when you shot Oswald. And he said, LaBelle, I just want to be a hero. And he said, I think I just messed things up good. Gail Newman, this was an extraordinary time in Dallas's history. Were you watching television avidly all day? Oh, yes, ma'am. I believe the whole nation was watching television. We were at church when Oswald was shot, and the pastor announced that someone had uh, assassinated the person that had killed President Kennedy. And then uh, the next day... You know, the whole nation was just glued to the television watching the funeral procession. Can you remember what particularly struck you that day? John John saluting. The little son. Uh-huh. Because he, he was, you know, his age was comparable to my children. You know, we were just, uh, I guess, uh, in mourning. This bizarre sequence of double killings raised great questions. Who actually fired the shots that killed Kennedy? Why did Ruby shoot Oswald? Was there a conspiracy? Just a week after the events in Dallas, President Johnson ordered a commission to investigate the assassination of President Kennedy. It was chaired by Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren. The Warren Commission reported in September 1964. So says the commission, Lee Harvey Oswald shot President Kennedy, but apparently not as part of a conspiracy. Everything pertaining to what's happening has never come to the surface. Jack Ruby, who shot Lee Harvey Oswald, gave one recorded interview in March 1965. He died of lung cancer in prison two years later. The people had, that had so much to gain and had such a material motive for putting me in a position I'm in will never let the true facts come of our boards to the, to the world. In late 1966, New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison began his own investigation into the Kennedy assassination. He believed there was at least one other gunman standing on the grassy knoll. He was interviewed by Panorama in 67. I think the only possible maxim uh, to, to apply in this case is let justice be done though the heavens fall. Getting this organization to release the facts is one of our major problems. Now don't ask me what the organization is because I can't say. But the implication clearly is the Central Intelligence Agency, your own security organization in the United States. It almost sounds like that, doesn't it? <laughs> I have no comment about that. What I think happened here is that uh, the president was assassinated by his government. 
Even today, visitors we've been talking to around Dealey Plaza are divided. I, I think there was only one shooter. I don't think there was any others. The powers that be are keeping the information from us would be my best guess. I believe that the grassy knoll over here, there was another bullet. Whether J. Edgar Hoover was involved, his possibility. I think it's too neat. I agree. I think that he was shot by more than one person. I don't know. I walked in the museum yesterday, and it, I think it was Oswald. It just does There's not enough. It's just not strong enough. I think it's like a fork in the road. You go down the path of conspiracy, you have to believe that the conspirators have been able to keep this silent for 50 years, and it's just bizarre to be here and have a conspiratorialist there with all the stuff, which I just bought. <laughs> In 2003, there was a Gallup poll which showed that three-quarters of Americans believed in a conspiracy. And in April of this year, a nationwide Associated Press poll showed that 59% of Americans believe that there was more than one gunman involved. Clint Hill in Washington, what's your view? My view is that you can't keep a conspiracy secret for 50 days much less 50 years. There were three shots fired on November 22nd, 1963. All three shots came from the same location and all fired by the same person, Lee Harvey Oswald. Dr. Salia. I have the same view, and it's based on simply the wounds and injuries. There's no question in my mind that President Kennedy had two wounds. Both of them were exit wounds uh, that we looked at. So there's no question in my mind that Lee Harvey Oswald was responsible. Jim Leval. The day it happened, the Friday, Captain Fritz come to my desk in the back, told me, he said, we got to work this pretty close because there may be some people, other people involved in it. So everything we investigated, we investigated with the eye of possibly a conspiracy but none showed whatsoever. Gail Newman, is it, in your view, and you were a witness too, is it as simple as that, cut and dried? Well, probably so. Uh, I've thought uh, a lot of times it would be hard for one person to figure out all the right places to be at the right time. But as uh, Clint Hill just said, I have often thought, if it was a conspiracy, someone would have had to talk about it. Clint Hill that your responsibility was uh, to protect the First Lady, and 50 years ago you did your very best, but you must have felt immediately after the assassination. Maybe you could have done more. I mean, do you still feel that now? Well, I still have some sense of guilt and responsibility because when you check everything involved that day, at the moment that the first shot was fired from that point on, I was the only person who had an opportunity to intervene or do anything, and I was not able to do so. But I realize I'm not faster than a speeding bullet, and after going back to Dallas in 1990 and spending time in Dealey Plaza and in the school book depository, I finally came to the conclusion that I did everything I could that day, even though I still feel that sense of guilt I should have done more. And your life was strongly affected by that feeling, wasn't it, for many decades? Oh, very much so. I uh, went through the ranks of the Secret Service, but uh, once I got a desk job and started to think about what had happened in Dallas, my emotions got the best of me physically, and I s deteriorated. And I went through a period after retirement for uh, absolute seclusion, uh, lived on alcohol and tobacco, I didn't want anything to do with anybody, and it took the intervention of a doctor to convince me that I had a choice to make. I could either live or die, and I chose to live, and so I quit that and started to pay attention to the important things in my life. Hugh Ainsworth, how did covering that assassination and the knowledge that you were so close to it physically, um, did that affect your career? I moved on to better jobs, and uh, but I always had to work on this. Every time a conspiracy theory came up, I had to run it down. Ken Sawyer, you went on to become quite a famous doctor, but not as a result of Kennedy's assassination. Or was it partly? 
I think uh, it was in a way because really he was my hero. I lost my hero and I wanted to carry on with his energy and I believed in many of the things he believed in and I ended up and now travel the world helping children uh, who have no possibilities and I think he had a major impact on my life. And Jim Leval, you're about to celebrate your 93rd birthday. Was this the most remarkable thing that's happened to you in a very long life? Well, I'm sure it's the uh, biggest event that's ever occurred in my life. But uh, I had a very satisfactory career in police work, and uh, that sustained me most of the way. And Gail Newman, you and your husband, and he's with you here today, um, did it change your lives in any way? We were all so young and naive that, uh, you know, we just went on with our life. What did you say to your son when he said, why did someone have to shoot the president? Can you remember what your answer was? Well, I don't know that I answered him at that time. Uh, two or three days afterwards, he climbed up in my lap and he said, Mama, why did why did uh, they shoot President Kennedy? And I tried to explain to him that there's bad people in the world that do bad things. And it's just something that happened. And he said, well, Mama, did you see all that blood? And he's 53 years old now, and he's, that, that memory is still vivid in his mind. Gail Newman, Jim Lavelle, Clint Hill, Dr. Ken Salyer, and Hugh Ainsworth. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. 